Welcome everyone to Congregation Lador Vador's Touch of Torah, our Torah study that we have weekly. And it is January 18th. And tonight we have a Rabbi Barry Silver, our leader and spiritual leader of Congregation Lador Vador, and our guest, our friend returning after a long uh, separation from us. Hiatus. Is Rabbi Zvi Khan. We are thrilled to have you both, Rabbi Barry Silver and Rabbi Zvi Khan, with us tonight. Take it away, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, Sharon started out by saying that we meet weekly, but I think we meet strongly. We are strongly in favor of advocating the Jewish position, and we have an amazing guest, um, Rabbi Zvi Khan. He's been on before with us, and this is like an old homecoming to see him back again. He's very busy now. He um, is working hard and uh, very diligently spreading Judaism far and wide. And now he's gonna share some of his wisdom with us. What we usually do is we have Rabbi Khan start out speaking about the Torah passage. Then I share a few words and then Rabbi Khan straightens me out and helps me to see the light. And then we have people come in from the outside and share some of their points of view. And the main thing is this, which is very unusual. You will not see many congregations where you have a, an Orthodox rabbi and let's say a progressive type rabbi sitting together, exchanging views and uh, doing so in an amiable fashion. I do not expect that I'm going to agree with everything Rabbi Khan says and he won't agree with everything I say, but that is the strength of Judaism. <laughs> If you look at the Talmud, you'll see people who don't really agree all the time, but they do agree on one thing, dialogue, wisdom, exchanging views, hearing all sides. This is very, very important. And so it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to have Rabbi Khan with us. And I, I would like you please to start out discussing the Torah passage, and then we're going to get into current events. And I'm very interested in getting your take on the uh, assault against the synagogue and what you think we should be doing about that. Rabbi Khan, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, it's so, it feels so amazing to be back. And uh, thank you for your warm words and, and, and Sharon and Rabbi, uh, both for inviting me back. And, and uh, it's true, I've been very busy, very happily busy, sometimes too busy, but, but I, I miss my friends at Lador Vador. I really, I really do. And it's so nice to see everybody's faces and uh, familiar faces. And, and uh, I just have a, a really warm, good feeling about being back and talking with everyone. So um, this week's Torah portion, and I remember some of the conversations, uh, Rabbi Silver, that we had in, in, in last year about the same Torah portion. And one of the, another one of the beautiful things about Judaism is that we circle around and around each year through the Torah portions, and we never say enough. We never say die. It's enough. There, there's no more to say. There's always more to say and more to think about and more uh, to share and be inspired by. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to start and privileged and honored to start uh, with, with one or two opening thoughts. Uh, the name of the Torah portion that, that's coming up this Shabbat is uh, Yitro. And uh, we, we, um, we kind of have to start right there and notice and, and appreciate the fact uh, that the Torah uh, has a portion named after a person who was not Jewish, who not only was not Jewish, who, who was called in Hebrew Kohen Midian, which might mean the chief of the tribe of Midian, the people of Midian, but some people translate it as the priest of Midian, that he was their religious spiritual leader and was an, was an idolater. Of course, that their, whatever their uh, philosophy or religion was, it, it wasn't one of monotheism, uh, and, and that was not a very popular idea at the time. And so uh, it's very really wonderful, I think, and inspiring that the Torah uh, names a Torah portion after Yitro and honors him and shows respect for him. And Moses himself shows tremendous honor and respect for Yitro and tremendous deference towards him uh, to the extent that th this uh, Torah portion relates that when Yitro comes up and with a suggestion or a proposal, he watches Moses uh, listening to the people's uh, questions and, 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 and hearing them really all through the day, people lining up to talk to Moses and, and question him and get advice and counsel from him and have him settle their differences and their arguments. And Yitro finally says, Moses, this is not working. This is not a good system. You can't 
every day, spend the whole day talking to the people and listening to the people. You have to, you have, to have other judges and other people, counselors and guides that can help the people as well. And Moses gives such a simple answer with his humility. He says, but the people want to come see me. How can I deprive them of that, so to speak? They want to talk to me. It doesn't matter that I can't do anything else and I, and I have to sit here all day. The main thing is they this is my job, so to speak. I have to be available to them. But Yitro convinces him to set up a system uh, of different levels, almost like a, a court system or a system of guides and counselors throughout the nation so that only the most difficult, challenging issues will come and make their way to Moses. And so he can attend to other things as the leader of the people, things that really require his involvement more than, than some of the more mundane matters and, and, pr and practical matters that the people were bringing to him. So I think I really, I, I love the fact that there's an acceptance of others outside of our religious faith emphasized so beautifully here, and also an acceptance of their ideas. There's a wonderful quote from the Talmud that says, uh, who is a wise person? One who is willing to learn from all mankind, one who's willing to learn from anyone, whatever the source of the information is. And this is a perfect example of that, where Moses said, I, I'm willing to learn from anyone. If, if this man comes, uh, Yitro, and, and tells me an idea, I'm willing to consider it. There, there's an open-mindedness that's very refreshing, and I think, again, very uh, inspiring. So um, there's a lot more to talk about, but I don't want to talk about everything. I just want to open with that. Okay, that's very good. Yes, that that is actually one of the greatest miracles of the Bible, that Moses listened to his father-in-law and took advice from his father-in-law willingly and freely and uh, amiably. And it is a, a great example of the fact that Jews in our highest state are not isolated, but we mix it up with other people. And uh, this is a great passage because of that, named after Yitro, and it talks about the Ten Commandments. And it's a, it's a very interesting thing that the commandments are mentioned in a passage named after someone who's not Jewish, indicating to many that the Jewish people have been a light to the nations, that the morality and the sense of justice that we have has been shared and spread throughout the world. And it's perhaps no accident that if you look at the Statue of Liberty and the Liberty Bell, both words on them were written by Jews. <laughs> so you could very well say it's a Judaic nation. The Liberty Bell proclaimed liberty throughout the land is from Leviticus and the Statue of Liberty, Emma Lazarus. And so the uh, message of the Jewish people is a universal one. Uh, Rabbi Khan, anything else you'd like to share about this passage or you wanna move on to current events? Well, as you mentioned, as you alluded to with the Ten Commandments are uh, that appear twice in the Torah, interestingly enough, but we're presented to the, with the Ten Commandments for the first time in this week's Torah portion, and the, the whole scene uh, dr with tremendous drama and fire and lightning and, uh, and, and thunder and loud sounds, it's, it's very a climactic scene that the Jewish people have left Egypt and been brought to this incredible moment at uh, Mount Sinai and, and the receiving of the Ten Commandments. And I, I think that, again, there's something here that maybe we take for granted, and that is that, again, as Rabbi Silver just said, this idea of a light into the nations, you don't have to be Jewish. They used to say you don't have, have to be Jewish to like Levy's rye bread. I don't know if anyone remembers that commercial. That was a big commercial when I was, was a kid. But you don't have to be Jewish to appreciate the Ten Commandments. You can go anywhere in the world practically and talk about the Ten Commandments and people um, view that as, as a high a moral and ethical and religious statement, a high point of, of spirituality in terms of the, the ideas and the concepts and the values of the Ten Commandments, not to say that every religious faith accepts them, which is not true, but they're given tremendous respect and they're viewed as a, as a cornerstone of, of, of kind of, again, morality and religious thought. And that obviously comes from the Torah. That's coming from the Jewish people. That's a, that's a gift to us that has been shared with the world and the world uh, I think has an appreciation for that, that and, and that's something that we should feel very uh, special about, and, and certainly to the best of our ability that we're able to, we should try and uh, keep, study the Ten Commandments. There's a, a lot there. It's not always what just meets the eye. There's a lot of information it, it kind of entwined there, and, and to keep them and observe them to the best of our uh, abilities, and to realize that uh, it's a gift to the whole world. 
There's another uh, commercial that I remember from the old days about um, we answer to a higher authority, Hebrew national. Hebrew national so right. <laughs> Jews answer to a higher authority, a Hebrew national whose name was Moses. So, and, the, and Moses does something that's quite remarkable. When the Jews are down below worshiping the golden calf and God's getting really angry, he says, I'm going to wipe these people out. They're no good. I do all these miracles and they're worshiping a golden calf. How is that for gratitude? I'm going to wipe them all out and I'm starting over with you, Moses. And what does Moses say? Something that is quite remarkable. He says, and you mentioned it, Rabbi, on his humility. No, he says, if they're going astray, it's my fault. I'm their leader. I'm responsible for them. Wipe me out and let the people live. What an incredible example of leadership. <laughs> it's hard to imagine our leaders today <laughs> doing such a thing. But right. Moses recognized that the people and the Jewish people had an important mission to do, and he wanted to serve them. He didn't uh, seek a higher position so that they could serve him. It's a very beautiful, beautiful lesson. And it, it's kind of amusing also when, when you look at God's words. <laughs> you know, when you have a, a father and a mother and the kids are acting astray, sometimes the mother would say, look what your kids are doing. Father says, look what your kids are doing. So God says, look what your people are doing. <laughs> now, before they were God's people. It's like, hey, these are my people. All of a sudden they're acting up and God says, look what your people are doing. <laughs> and Moses says, hey, I I'm sorry. <laughs> and then he comes down and things kind of get straightened out. Of course, he um, told the Jewish people, there's good news and bad news. I, I bargained God down to 10 commandments. The, uh, that's the good news. The bad news is adultery is still one of them. So you can't, can't go around doing that. You got to you gotta behave. But from my way of thinking, um, modern Jewish perspective, is that the Ten Commandments are not exalted because they are the epitome of morality. I think today, if we wanted to come up with 10, we could probably come up with maybe better ones. And I know to you that might be blasphemous to think that human beings could do a better job than God. But I think that the reason why, to me, they're special is because they show that Jewish people and all people need to have a moral code, not just a legal code, a moral code. And that was our first effort to do so. And so that's why it's significant and special because this shows that this is our effort to try to impose morality and to say that it comes from a, a higher source. One other thing I'll point out about the Ten Commandments, and perhaps we can get your take on this too, Rabbi Khan, is that according to Christianity, we were born in original sin, that the sin of Adam and Eve contaminates all of us. I'm sure you're familiar with the doctrine. The Ten Commandments refutes that. They claim to believe in the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Commandments says God doesn't remember the sins of the parents past the third generation. And therefore, even if there was an Adam and Eve and even if they committed sin, we couldn't possibly be affected by it according to the terms of the Ten Commandments. But the good deeds he remembers for a thousand generations. So this passage, which Christian fundamentalists want so desperately to impose into our schools and our courtrooms and everything, it refutes the entire basis of Christianity, saying that we could be held accountable for the sins of the fathers, which is really a very immoral notion in the first place. Rabbi Khan, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, I I, uh, I think that 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 concept is a very dangerous uh, one and a very uh, you know highly disturbing one. As if each person who's born is already born into some kind of guilt and is carrying guilt for a sin that was committed thousands of years ago. It's true that in Judaism we we give. The Torah itself gives tremendous attention and doesn't it never glosses over the sins of the of our ancestors and the people who came before, but even the greats uh, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and, and Rebecca and Moses himself and Aaron and Miriam. Uh, when they do something wrong, the Torah some, not only sometimes mentions it, but goes they're, they're punished tremendously and dramatically and drastically more than most people would think it makes sense, more is reasonable. Um, so the sins are not covered up and we're always, we're always um, enjoined to learn from that, to try and say, okay, what, 
what were they thinking? Where did they go wrong that we can learn from that? Where did these great spiritual leaders go wrong so that we can uh, understand and, and incorporate, you know, learn from that and do better ourselves and, and, and see in ourselves, introspect in ourselves and see maybe we've done something in a similar vein that we need to correct. But the idea that, uh, that we're born into this world and we have to try and quote unquote cleanse ourselves of some kind of original sin, I think, as you said, is a, is a false and very dangerous doctrine. And not, not only that, it turns the Jewish ideal on its head. Judaism says the exact opposite. It says the spirit, the neshama, which you were born with is pure. That we're born not in sin. We're born in purity. And that's our basic nature. And therefore, if we go astray, we have the ability to return to purity. We try to do it every Shabbat and every Yom Kippur. If we really believe that we were born in sin, then we wouldn't bother even trying. Because if our nature was sinful, why bother trying to fix something that can't be fixed? It's a very harmful notion. And the idea of Judaism, that we're born with a pure neshama, and also that we're created, but selem Adonai, in a, in a divine image, is a very, very powerful notion. And I believe that Jews need to speak out more forcefully to try to correct the record as far as the uh, impression that people might get. Because many people see the Bible through a Christian lens. And so they figure, well, Christians believe in original sin. I guess Jews do too. And uh, I think we need to do a better job of speaking up and sharing the Jewish message because it's true that it's been adopted by Christians and Muslims, but not in its pure form. And many times, as in this instance, it's actually teaching the exact opposite. Um, okay, Rabbi Khan, why don't we open it up to um, what's going on in the world and then we'll have everybody else join in the conversation. Tell me your thoughts about the... Um, terrorist threat against the synagogue and the rabbi? When I first uh, I opened my phone at one point and I saw the story come up with the breaking news, uh, it was obviously like everyone, you know, how, how painful it was to hear again about Jews in a synagogue on Shabbat and, and some crazy person is, is holding them hostage. I really, I, I thought, I can't believe this. And then as the hours, as hours went on, I thought to myself, it's hard to see how there's going to be a good ending. It's hard to see how that's going to happen. Obviously hoping it would happen, praying it would happen, but, but hard to see that it would have happened. And then, and I kept checking back and checking back. Uh, and, and then to be able to finally read uh, that they were freed and that they were, thank God, no, no injuries, no casualties, and, and, and that it was over, and they had all survived, and to read about this rabbi who, who apparently showed tremendous, first tremendous kindness to this man, and then tremendous poise, and then, and then a tremendous aggressiveness and assertiveness to help the other, to himself and the surviving hostages escape. I just thought, you know, I was like, thank God, Baruch Hashem, thank God that, uh, that it ended this way. And of course, we're all appreciative, uh, as appreciative as we can be to the police and the FBI and the SWAT team who came and negotiated with him and, and, and handled things in such a way that it had, uh, thank God that it had a positive ending. So it, it went from the emotions went from, you know, really, really difficult, painful emotions to triumphant emotions and emotions of gratitude and thanksgiving at the end. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you that what, how fortunate it is that none of the hostages were hurt or killed. However, um, and the rabbi said, we don't have to say Kaddish for anyone, but I would suggest that we should say Kaddish for this deranged person. This person probably was brainwashed from his youth into a cult, an ideology where, remember Martin Luther King, whose birthday we celebrated, he said something about Bull Connor. When Bull Connor passed away, Bull Connor was the one who, the police officer who was so vicious towards Martin Luther King and the others. When Bull Connor died, he said, today marks the cessation of the beating of a heart inside of a man who died many years ago. Wow. You know, th this person who came into the synagogue, spiritually and morally and his humanity was deadened in him long ago. And I think he's a casualty of Islamic fundamentalism. I am not saying that we should try to um, commiserate with him or think, oh, they shouldn't have done what they did. He, he's like, a, like a, a cancer cell that turned bad and you have to excise it in order to save the body. 
So I obviously we have to deal with enemies in a very forceful way to protect life. But he's one of many casualties, just like the people who attacked the United States on 9-11. These people were all brainwashed in madrasas. And we need to defend ourselves against them. But I would suggest that the best way for us to defend ourselves against them is by challenging the ideology. Because if all we do is try to get more security around the synagogues and have more police and have more training and more drills, yes, that helps. But it won't get to the source of the problem. The source of the problem is fundamentalist Muslim ideology and also fundamentalist Christian ideology. The people that shot up synagogues in the past were quoting Christian scripture. We need to get at the source. And that is the ideology that is motivating people because there's no way, no matter how much protection we seek, that we can protect ourselves against a billion Muslims and hundreds of millions of Christians who potentially are reading things in their scriptures that are very, very dangerous. And I think the best place to start, and I'd like to get your reaction to this, Rabbi Khan, because I suspect you would take issue with me, is that in the Torah, it has this chosen people concept in which God orders the Jews to commit genocide against other people who are worshiping the wrong way or worshiping the wrong God. And then this concept of God ordering death to non-believers metastasized and it became a variant in the Quran and Christian scriptures. And it spread. It was even more contagious and more lethal in the hands of Christians and Muslims. And now we see many, many millions of people having been sacrificed, either by imbibing this ideology and dying or killing other people. I think it's time that we Jews set the record straight, say that God doesn't order people to kill others. And uh, he didn't do it in our Bible. That's not really God talking. And he doesn't do it in the uh, Bibles of the Muslims and Christians. Uh, I'm curious to get your take on that, Rabbi Khan. Well, let me go back to the start. Um, it's very hard for me, if, if not impossible, uh, and this could be a failing of my own, to find room in my heart to feel any sympathy for, and I'm not saying you did, or you said you didn't commiserate with, I don't, I don't, um, I guess I don't feel comfortable making the choice to go down that path. Uh, if one of the uh, Jews in the synagogue had been armed, or if in that synagogue there was a, a, a pistol, a gun, a security weapon that was put aside and that they had been trained to use it, and that at the right moment they had shot this man, I wouldn't have been unhappy. I would have been ecstatically happy. I, I, I kind well, of- I don't, I, don't take it, I don't take issue with you there. Like I said, Jews need to defend themselves like a cancer. If you have a cancer, you need to do everything you can to get it. This guy was a cancer. But I, I compare it to a rabid dog. If a rabid dog was attacking, you would destroy that dog or kill the dog. I would feel bad for the dog <laughs> because it's got some kind of contagion. It's got some kind of virus or illness. But I would still, I agree with you, I would still take the dog out. And if we were able to do it, I would be happy about it. But I would still feel that there was a loss of life. I understand. I understand. Um, I guess, I guess that what I'd like to distinguish is what you said about we'll never be able to necessarily defend ourselves from all of these enemies, the hundreds of millions, the bill, whatever that number is. So we have to start with the ideology. I kind of see it the opposite way. I don't know, I, I don't know how the Jewish people can go about um, uh, convincing these hundreds of millions of people, uh, at least those Christians and Muslims who use their ideology for violence, uh, there are so many hundreds of millions who don't, and that's always important to keep in mind. But for those who do, um, I don't know how we're going to convince them. I do know, I do know, and I think post-Holocaust, this is a lesson that, that all Jews, I hope, can, can share, I do know that we have an obligation, a sacred obligation to protect ourselves and to defend ourselves, which is not at all different than what you said. And I think that's where things start. One of the, one of the shifts that I've had in my own thinking over these last couple of years has been to go from a person who really was not at all comfortable with guns or violence on any level and moving more and more and more as, as you see the threats coming at us and increasing in this country and in other places in the world, 
my thinking has changed to say every synagogue, every Jewish school, every Jewish institution should have security training, should have, if they can afford it, armed guards. And if they can't afford, afford armed guards, there should be some training for members of the synagogue or the school uh, or the Jewish institution to be able to defend themselves because we cannot be naive enough. We cannot allow ourselves to be, be naive enough to think it can happen to us. It'll never happen to us. It is happening to us. It just happened again in a synagogue. And so I think that that should be our focus and our energy as opposed to what looks to me, again, perhaps wrongly as, a, as an impossible task of convincing the, you know, the, the, the so would-be terrorists and the would-be haters and the would-be violent uh, people of different ideologies I don't know how to convince them to stop. I just know we can and should try and protect ourselves. Well, I, I know one way that we could convince them to stop, and that would be to acknowledge that our Bible has ideas in it that are not accurate and that are dangerous and violent. And once we take the first step, then we can encourage them to do the same thing. I, I listened to someone last night from the uh, ADL and they were also quoting the rabbi who was in the situation. And, and they said, we need to stamp out anti-Semitism. And words matter. Words are dangerous. And if people are saying things that are anti-Semitic, we must stand up and object and oppose that. And I thought, well, that's interesting. The source of anti-Semitism, the most lethal source of it, is Christian scripture. So why is it that he's saying that if there's people saying things against the Jews, we should stand up against it because it's dangerous, but in the most dangerous place of all where people accept it as the word of God and think that it's infallible, why is it that we say nothing about that? That's the most dangerous of all. And, and just in case, perhaps Rabbi Khan and others, you're not very familiar with Christian scripture, just like someone who might not be familiar with a dangerous disease, they might think, well, I don't really want to know about it. I'd rather know nothing about it. The lack of knowledge is dangerous. So let me just share with you from the uh, book of John. The only father we have is God himself, is what the Jews were saying. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and now I am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now with Thessalonians, it says, for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that may be served. And then there's many other passages, many other passages of a similar vein. Now I say to you, is there any example of anti-Semitism more grotesque than that? saying that the Jews are the children of the devil who killed Jesus. And I say to you that as long as people accept that as God's word, as long as the passion of the Christ is shown to millions of children and who are seeing the Jews glory and revel in killing Jesus, which is a fictional story that never happened, as long as they're being fueled with hatred, there's going to be generation after generation of synagogues being destroyed, and just like we've seen pogroms, crusades, inquisitions, holocaust, it's going to go on and on. There's only one solution to it, to get to the source, and to say that these stories, these anti-Semitic blood libels are lies and are wrong. And if we won't say it, if we won't even defend ourselves, then what are we? What kind of self-respect do we have if we just shutter ourselves up in our synagogues and hope that we can find enough barricades and enough police officers and enough guns to protect us from an ideology that has it in for us. And by the way, the Quran and the Hadith have very similar passages, and I think it's time that we refute them and challenge them. And uh, as Elie Wiesel said, there may be times that we cannot prevent an injustice, 
but there should never be a time that we fail to oppose it. And I think the Jewish leadership has really been negligent in not even opposing this type of ideology. Um, if you'd like, we can open it up to others. Yeah, Rabbi, let's I, open it up, absolutely. Let, let's hear what others have to say about this or the Torah passage or anything else. Nancy uh, has her hand raised. Go ahead, Nancy, unmute yourself. Just click on the little microphone. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, this is this is all so frightening. And actually, I agree with Rabbi Khan too that we we have to look after ourselves and protect ourselves. Also, we have to refute this kind of viciousness when we can. But you know, people, when you say things to people, they defend what they believe as the word somehow maybe it will soften over time. But when you have people, infants, learning from the cradle, this hatred. I watched on uh, one of the news things I get from Israel just a few days ago, and it showed graduations of kindergartners. And they were doing, uh, singing the songs about killing the Jews or, you know, and destroying everybody. And they even had cho the children in, in little um, like army, you know, military outfits with guns and walking around, parading around and shooting and then lying on their bellies and creeping up to the edge of the stage and, and shooting us all. You know, they learned, and they, these were children probably five years old and no more, but they learned from the cradle, but they get off the mother's knee, um, this hatred. I don't know how we're going to beat that anytime soon. That's it. <laughs> well, there's a very there's a very simple way of combating it to get to the source of it. We know where it's coming from. It's not like we have no clue. It's coming right out of the Quran, and it's coming out of the Hadith, and it's coming out of Christian scripture. It's about time that there was a spiritual transformation in this world, so we stopped killing each other over ancient literature. And it's about time that the Jewish people lead that transformation. We are supposed to be the light to the nations. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't understand why people think that we should just blindly sit back and watch while these ancient doctrines and lies are taught to children, which is really a form of child abuse, and Absolutely. we do nothing about it and just throw up our hands. We, we should not feel helpless. And, and I agree, of course, that we should defend ourselves. But the best way to defend ourselves is to challenge these lies, these blood libels that are told against the Jewish people. Our people have been lied about for thousands of years, and all we do is cringe mm -hmm. because for years we've been unable to defend ourselves because it was right. illegal and it was a death penalty for Jews to speak out in public. Those days are gone, and now we need to defend ourselves from lies. Um, who else? I think uh, Stanley. Yeah. Unmute yourself, Stanley. Well, Rabbi, in a, in a sense, you're saying we should appease. And uh, I don't think that works. And it's a generational thing. If you, if you expect to correct the Koran and uh, Catholic teaching overnight, that's, that, that's a fool's errand. But um certainly well, let we me, need to Stanley, we need when to did defend I, when ourselves. Did I, when did I say that we should appease anybody? You didn't, but what you're proposing is tantamount to appeasement. How how is that appeasement by challenging the the, the lies that are said about Jews? How is that in any way appeasement? Well, I mean you're saying we should uh I'm saying we, the opposite. We should, well, it doesn't sound like it. Um, we're, we're, you're saying that we need to retrain th these folks uh, and, and, if, and uh, change the, the meaning of the Koran or whatever other document they're looking at and to, uh, to bring them around to our way of thinking. Uh, 
that to me just this it can't work. I mean, well, that- in the meantime. In the meantime, we've got synagogues being uh, bashed and burned, and uh, and it didn't just happen in Texas; it happened uh, many other places. The worst uh, recently, of course, in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Um, so you you can certainly restate what you want to say, but I I I think it's going way too far to. Um, uh, there's no way to extend an olive branch. Well, let, let me just respond to what you're saying. What I'm saying is the opposite of appeasement. What the Jewish establishment is doing is appeasing them. There are passages that are lying about Jews, and the establishment is saying, don't say anything about it, because that's their Bible. I'm saying the opposite of appeasement. I'm saying we shouldn't appease them. I'm saying that we should challenge them and claim rightfully, and we can show historically, that these are lies. That is the antithesis of appeasement. Secondly, I never ever suggested that this would happen overnight. Obviously, to bring about a change in thinking in religion doesn't happen overnight. I never suggested that for a second. What I did suggest is that we should begin that effort so that at some point, these lies will be refuted. Um, thirdly, you, you say that, well, it can't work. You can't change people's religious beliefs. And one thing we know for sure is that it absolutely can and does work. There's something called a zeitgeist. It's the spirit of the times. And religions go through these zeitgeists. There was a time when the Catholic Church said that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus, and they aligned with Hitler. And they said that Hitler was doing God's work. And then there was a change of heart because many people, including Jews, challenged that notion and and they changed it. And now they know they don't, the Catholic Church doesn't teach that anymore. There are no people that I know of believing in Apollo or Zeus or Athena. And religious views are always undergoing change. The Jews no longer sacrifice animals. So one thing we know for sure is that religious ideas not only can change, they do change, and we have the capacity to do it. And not only that, Jewish people are commanded and ordered to be the agent of that change. We are supposed to be the people who bring about truth to the world. And therefore to suggest, well, don't bother trying, you can't bring truth to the world, it's a fool's errand. That's not what Judaism teaches. Judaism teaches that we can bring about a world of truth and that we're obligated and mandated to be the agent for that transformation. Anybody else want to share some thoughts? Rabbi Khan, I'd love to hear what your take is on this. Um, I, I, I think really as often happens when people focus on perhaps two different ideas, they're not, they're not arguing because both agree with the other point, meaning that I, Rabbi Silver has made it clear that as, as committed as he is to the idea of challenging the whole belief system and structure and kind of the foundation of anti-Semitism and, and Christianity and Islam, that he does also believe strongly in Jews defending themselves. And as much as I focus on how important it is for Jews, uh, and I think this is what Stanley was getting at when he would talk to, we have to defend ourselves and Nancy is, as well. Um, it, it, that doesn't mean that we would disagree and say, no, there should be no effort made to kind of change these ideas. I guess the, the question comes down to a matter of emphasis and where it's best to put our energies in there, there might be some, might be some differentiation. But I think both, both obviously can and should work hand in hand uh, for people who, yeah. and the, the Jews, thank God, have lots of, uh, we have lots of talented and, and uh, 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 bright and smart and active people, there, there definitely could be some focusing on the defense aspect and some self-defense and some focusing on the idea, on the theo- theological ideas and combating those ideas. And I think that's actually happening right now, maybe not enough right. and maybe not in both areas, not enough. But I think both are, both, are, both are correct. It's not a matter of really one or the other. It's how do you do right. both of those things and, and, and therefore you're doing one and the other. And I, and I think that's really Im- important. Um, I, I tend to feel myself just personally 
uh, that, uh, that I don't know if I have, as I said before, I don't know if I have it in my heart to spend a lot of time trying to uh, change people, other religions, their views. If they hate Jews on a deep enough level to, to want to harm us, all I want to do is try and stop them and do what I can to, to protect uh, Jewish people who we tend to we tend to assume everybody wants to be nice and play nice. And we tend to assume that there are no real threats out there, but we're we no longer obviously we no longer can assume that. And so we have to think about how to protect ourselves. It's a shame. It really is truly a shame. But there's too much happening in, in the United States, which was such a haven for us for so long to ignore it anymore. If everyone if anyone did ignore it, we really can't ignore it anymore. Thank you, Rabbi Khan, because I, I'm glad you clarified that, that it's not an either or proposition. It's not as if, well, I'm going to defend myself by having armed police, and therefore I'll just completely ignore the ideology. It's, uh, I use the same example with cancer. With cancer, when, when you have symptoms, you have to deal with the symptoms, but you also want to get at the cause. You don't want to just ignore the cause, otherwise it just keeps happening over and over. And it's, as you say, it's not an either or. And perhaps the best example of that is the state of Israel. There, there's no other country I know of that is singularly as successful at defending itself militarily and is as tough as Israel. And yet, at the same time, it's also fighting the ideological battle. And one of the best examples of that was the son of Hamas. And I don't know if you've read that book. Yes. It's a fascinating book about an Israeli officer with a Shin Bet who went in and befriended the son of the Hamas leader. And this son of the Hamas leader recognized that the Israelis weren't as evil and bad as he was told. And the Israelis found out an amazing amount of information from him and he became a strategic ally. Why? Because he saw the humanity in him and tried to reach out to him. And I, I just wanna share this also. And, and I, again, if there's somebody who's threatening the Jewish people, they have to be taken out. There are not many people as extreme as I am in that regard. I think Hamas should be wiped out. I'm not a mamby pammy appeaser. I think Hamas, they're a terrorist group dedicated to destroy Israel. I think the civilized world should take them out. And I think the same as ISIS. So I don't appease them. But I will say this, that I believe it was Christopher Hitchens who said, good people do good things and bad people do bad things. But for good people to do bad things takes religion. And, and the reason I say that is because many people who have it in for the Jews and are doing very bad things to Jewish people, they think they're doing good things because they were taught from the time they were a child that God wants them to do this and he's ordering them to do that and that God doesn't like Jews and he wants people to Take, a, take off after them. And th this is something that you're, that's God's will. These, a lot of these people, they're not people that woke up and said, I'm going to do something mean and nasty and horrible. There are people who said, I'm going to do what my pastor told me, what the church told me, what the Bible tells me, what this voice in my head is telling me. They didn't just wake up and say, I'm going to be an evil person. And that is why, that is why we must combat the ideology because it's taking people that want to be good and it's making them do very despicable things and think that they're doing good things. And so we, we ignore the ideology at our peril. And I'm not saying it's gonna happen overnight, but I am saying it'll never happen if we don't start now. Um, anybody else wanna share some thoughts with us, comments about this or any other topic? Go ahead, Valerie. Well, first of all, thank you very much for being as, as insightful as both of you are. You're, the information that, is, that, that passes between the two of you is very enlightening, and it's really very amazing. I think getting back to where we live in this country, I think uh, the, the, there's a faction in this country that is undermining society norms. We're becoming way, way, way too liberal with those that commit crimes. We have something called criminal justice. And in so many cases, it, appear, it appears that the criminals have more justice than the victims. It seems like our judicial system and our, our legal system and our policing system are letting those people that, that perpetrate crimes get away with so much that it seems that, that there's no threat to them anymore. 
I mean, that seems to be the direction that we're heading in. And, you know, that's why there's so many people up in arms, if you will, pardon the pun, that are trying to buy guns now because they don't feel that this country, generally speaking, is there to protect those people that are, are obeying the laws, that are doing the right thing. They're at risk and they, they can't seem to get a handle on the fact that the criminals are the ones that have to be go after. The police are being vilified. The people that, that want to protect themselves are being vilified. And the criminals seem to be getting more and more protection in this country. And I think we have a real problem heading, but that we're heading in that direction right now. And I think the general population is becoming very, very threatened. And those people that want to perpetrate heinous crimes are becoming more and more emboldened. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, we definitely need to have a better criminal justice system. And I think part of the problem is that people who are doing things that are not violent and uh, like if they have a problem with drugs are being locked away. And people who are violent people who should be put away for a long time are being let go to make room for all these other people. And I, I think that I agree with you, Valerie, that people who are doing violent crimes <laughs> are not punished very severely and that, that is wrong. And, but the system is askew and we, we need to have a better system of justice. And that's where Jews should be a, a guiding light as far as what, what is just and what isn't. Because I don't see a lot of justice in our, in our system. And I agree with you, Valerie, that people who commit violent crimes should not, not be coddled at all. Um, anybody else? Um, Rabbi Khan, I would be interested in just hearing a little bit about what you're up to. What are you, what are you doing these days and uh, how are oh, things going oh, with you? Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, I was, uh, you know, I've always been in Jewish education. And so I, I was hired by a school here in Boca Raton, a Jewish high school to teach. And I was trying to get back into either administration or education. Uh, I had been a teacher for a long time and then I became an administrator for a long time. And I'll tell you something interesting. <laughs> At my last job, a guy said to me, if an administrator stays in administration for too long, he forgets what it's like for the teachers to be a teacher and he loses touch with that. And, uh, and I have, I, I, I now am back as a teacher in the classroom and I realized the truth of that statement totally because I really did forget uh, what it was like for teachers and the challenges for teachers and, the, and, and, and how hard it is, really, how truly difficult it is to balance all the juggle, all the balls you have to juggle to be successful as a teacher with, you know, the kids and the parents and the, and the, and the administrators and the board and, and other teachers and everything that's going on. Um, so it's hard, but I'm really happy to be back in the classroom uh, and, and enjoying it very much. Um, it, it takes probably about, gosh, I don't know how much longer now that I've been out for so long in terms of my preparation and in terms of marking the paper. I feel like, I feel like all I really do is mark papers. I don't know when I have time to eat or sleep. I just mark papers and mark papers and mark papers. Um, but then I also, in addition to the teaching job, what, what keeps me so busy is I also uh, tutor. My wife has a tutoring business. She teaches and also tutors children. And so she brought me in. And, and so I tutor children um, teach children for a long time and then tutor some more children at night. So I'm basically working with kids all day, which is very uh, exciting and nice, but also hard, challenging. Do you, do you still live down south? Where Where do you live? I'm in Boca. Oh, you live in Boca? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. And what grade are you teaching? Uh, during the day for my actual formal teaching, I'm, I teach uh, grades nine through 12. And in the tutoring, the kids are usually in the always in elementary school. So I have like a, a, a second or a third grader and maybe a fifth grader, sixth grader, you know, kids in that uh, age range. Yeah, what I found in teaching that age is that you really have to be on top of your game. You got to really know not just what you're teaching, but a lot more than that, because I'll ask you questions and want you to go into depth about it. You got to be really knowledgeable about all of these things. And also you have to be part teacher and part entertainer. Right. Yes. Because the kids are used to all this fast paced information coming in and they want to be entertained. And if it drags on too slow, then they get they get very antsy. And so it's, it's a very challenging job. It takes a yes. lot of energy, a lot of effort to be able to uh, to do that. And then the kids are lucky to have you. I'm really glad that they have someone like you who can teach them a lot of well, wonderful things about Judaism. I appreciate that. But what, what you just said about the keep it really exciting and fast paced or they'll find it boring. 
I have a lot of kids who find it boring, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure they feel so appreciative that they have me as a teacher, but, uh, but sometimes, a lot of time, you know, sometimes it's really fun. Sometimes with the kids, I'm able to uh, really connect with them in a good way, but it's a, it's a hard job. I really do appreciate teachers much more than I did now, you know, than when I had spent all those years in the offices as Is opposed to in the classroom. What's the orientation of the school? Uh, it's an Orthodox high school. Is it the one that's on the campus of the JCC? No, that's actually a very, that's a really big uh, school. The one that's there, I think has almost 800 kids. Uh, the, the school I teach at is, um, it depends how well people know Boca Raton, but it's, it's right off the power line in Palmetto. Um, um, what do you call 18th it? Uh, intersection. If, you, yeah. if you, if there's a, there's a, there's a wind Dixie right near that intersection and we're kind of behind the wind dixie a little bit further down we have a high school but there's only about 100 150 kids it's not as big as some of the other jewish schools around very good well rabbi khan always a pleasure to have you and uh, thanks for stopping by we'll uh, we'll call upon you on occasion when you uh, feel the, the in the mood you want to chat with us you're always welcome at, at lador bador you're Thank you. I mean, I, I'm just so appreciative that we can have you and you mix it up with us and we have difference of opinions and it's all it's all good and it's all friendly. This is very important, very important for the Jewish people to have an example of someone who's willing to help unite the Jewish people in friendly dialogue. Thank you so much for uh, being here and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you again, Sharon. And thanks everybody. So, so nice to see so many familiar faces and some, some new faces as well. Th thanks. I look forward to being able to do it again. Thank you. Zai gesund. Zai gesund.